Well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's absolutely super to see so many people here. Uh, I think we've got a really interesting uh, set of conversations really, that we're going to have. Um, what we're going to do, I think everyone knows, so I'll just explain. Um, Conrad's going to um, talk through the topic, and then we have a really interesting panel um, who will introduce themselves as they arrive once Conrad's finished the, the key thing. Mm. And what we want you to do after they've commented on what they've heard is to ask your own questions. Kate, for example, tells me that there was a, an A-level maths class this morning, sorry, exam this morning, which might have prompted a few pertinent questions in some <laughs> part of the audience. <laughs> Hope you did well. Okay, so without any further introduction from you, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, the very distinguished and well-known Conrad Wolfram, mm. whose theme is one that I've discussed with him. Norseman and I had a lunch with him, I suppose, about two years ago. And I said, in due course, Conrad, I want you to come and talk to the company about the really enthusiastic way in which you can see how change could be introduced in an absolute key part of, of society, our society, and others. And as you know, that's part of my theme for the year. What are the things facing the UK that these management consultants could do something to change and improve? So, come on. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, I want to talk about how machinery fits with human skills. And in particular, talk about maths and coding, which I think are very much at the centre of this dichotomy that exists now between the real world and education. And I want to start by asking, it, it's a rather peculiar thing that right now maths and computation and things around that are so crucially important in real life. They drive our economies, many of the jobs that are created, even everyday living is sort of predicated on having quantitative understanding to some extent, and a much greater extent than 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, than, uh, uh, and so, in a sense, maths is extremely popular in real life. Step into education, and you find the opposite. It's more disliked than probably it ever has been. It's forced down people's throats, apparently. And yet, somehow, uh, it's deemed to be this very important subject. So how has this happened? What's gone wrong and can we fix it? Well, I actually think that the real problem is there are two subjects called maths. They have the same name, but they're pretty fundamentally different subjects, and increasingly different. So this subject in the real world uses machinery of computers to do a crucial part of maths, which is calculating answers. And increasingly, computers do almost all of that. Humans almost never actually manually calculate things, except in some very simple cases or an estimating. Turn to education. Almost all of our energy for all of the compulsory maths education that people go through for 10 plus years of their life is about how you calculate by hand. So we've got two fundamentally different subjects, which we call by the same name and get confused by governments and many people, actually even quite technical people in workforce, get confused about what maths they really want. And so in a sense, there's a very simple solution to this, which is we need to make sure we use the machinery in education that we use in real life for the subject itself, not just for how we teach it. So let me just quickly whip through sort of the basis of this. I think it's important to understand why are we learning maths? And in particular, why is maths deemed a general purpose subject occupied by very few subjects that it's deemed more or less throughout the world everyone should learn? Well, I think there are three good reasons for the right subject. The technical jobs we've talked about that are so driving our economies. Um, what I call everyday living, just surviving, knowing how to analyze the quantitative things that are thrown at us every day and knowing how to prosper within that. And what you might call the third one is sort of logical mind training. Having a way to analyze the world that has some sort of structure. Maths arguably has been the most successful problem solving system. And if you're explicitly or implicitly using it, it's very helpful to life if you really get it in your bones. And so, in a sense, those are three reasons I think that do justify potentially maths for everyone. 
What is it when we say we're doing maths? What are we doing? Well, I think it's got about four steps to it. I think you're defining questions. Now, if I speak for too long and we seal the room, how long is it that we can all survive with the oxygen that's present here? That would be a question to define, hopefully not one I'll demonstrate. Um, so that's kind of the first part of the process. You're defining a sort of perhaps a fuzzy question, then you're translating it to maths, this abstract language that allows you to compute answers so successfully. We can talk about it in English, but we're not going to get as far, usually. And then we have to interpret the results. We have to go back. We have to say, well, we got, you know, x equals 3. What, what does that mean? You know, does it mean we have three hours? And the problem at the moment in education is this problem that we're spending almost all our time doing step three by now. <coughs> and that's drowning out these other steps that are so crucial uh, in many of the walks of life that, that you represent here. And that, that, you know, analysis, many of the things that pertain to management, pertain to everyday jobs that people do. So we should be using a computer to do step three. That's what it's there for, computing. And we should be using students much more for steps one, two, and four, and conceptually empowering. Maths is this problem-solving process where you go through these steps, and you literally go around this helix until you get an answer that you think is sufficiently good to your question. That's what maths is. It's that process of problem-solving. And, you know, maths is a much bigger subject than just calculating, and that's what gets crucially confused, particularly by governments. You know, they think that if you're rigorous at calculating, that you're good at maths. Well, that might have been an issue before computers, when you had to do the calculating by hand, but you don't know. Computers are many times better, and that's why um, often um, uh, that confusion arises, I think. So here's a very simple, I thought I'd actually give you an example. This is something you probably had to do at school, solve equations by hand. And so I, I can do the computer on that, but you see, here's... And you've probably never done it since school, many of you. Um, now, you see, I could just make this a bit more complicated here, like I could put a cube in that, and then you get a rather more complicated solution uh, that you didn't have to do at school. And, you know, I can do that in a second, but you, you wouldn't get to that after 10 years of studying. Actually, it gets even worse than this if this demo works. I'm going to talk to my phone. Solve x cubed plus 2 equals 2y, and y minus x equals 5. Siri willing, uh, we got the answer, and I'll just try and show you on the screen. So there is the answer from my phone, Wolf mouth to that question. <laughs> so, but the point I'm making is, if I can talk to my phone in 20 seconds and get an answer to a question that I haven't learned how to do in 10 years of slog at school, why on earth are we spending our students' lives, learning that rather than learning something more empowering. Now the machine can do that. So I'm very much talking about the subject, not how we teach it, but this subject matter itself. I think often the technology gets muddled up about the, between the, the process of delivering the education, the teacher versus other, other mechanisms, and the subject. Maths has changed fundamentally in the outside world in a way that history, for example, hasn't. We need to reflect that in the real world in the way that the computer does it. So, I mean, it's an obvious thing which must come up many times in when you're helping organizations transform their management. Better deployment of the wrong management or the wrong subject in this case won't fix the problem. You can teach maths in quotes as well as you like, but if it's the wrong subject, it's wrong. It's not going to help get you to where you need to be. Now, one question often comes up, which we absolutely can discuss, is, you know, people say, well, you need the basics first. Don't you need basics? But, but I think what they mean by this, usually, with respect to maths, is don't you need to learn how to do it by hand before you learn how to do it on a computer? The thing is, I think they're muddling up the basics of, you know, how, how calculating happens with how you go through that four-step process. I think you absolutely need to understand the basics, get into your bones how you use the problem-solving cycle. But part of that may be to use a computer to do it, not, not yourself. Well, that's a very quick rendition of the answer there. But the thing I think that's most exciting is, people in education often split the conceptual from the vocational, the practical from the intellectual. I actually see those converging in modern life. A lot of the things we all need to do in our jobs are highly conceptual, and they've got more conceptual because we have machines to do the more drudgery the more product, production procedural work 
that has traditionally had to be done by humans, particularly in sort of computing sets. So I think we've got this opportunity to make things more practical and more conceptual at the same time. There's no dichotomy between those. And I think typically more motivation. The, the other thing that's incredibly strange to me is the, the use of abstraction. So we all abstract to different ideas that help us understand the world. Maths is a great way to do that. But why do we give people abstraction first? So you need to learn how to solve this equation. Once you've learned that, if you're very, very, very lucky, you might get to apply it to a problem in your life. The result of it is that nobody sees the connection. And I love asking politicians, you know, when was the last time you used a quadratic equation? <laughs> Except to help your children. Perhaps the most important thing, I think, is if you remove the computer, you remove a lot of context. And I think this is true across all things where machinery is involved in modern life, but particularly this one. So here's what I mean. It's the reason that maths and competition is so important in real life today. And it wasn't 100 years ago. I mean, mathematicians hate me for saying this, but the reality is maths was not that useful for working stuff out, except in bits of physics and some accountancy and things, until we had mechanized computing, because it didn't work for everyone. When you had lots of calculations to do, you got stuck because you couldn't do the calculations. That got blown out of the water beyond all imagination over the last decades. That's turned it. It's allowed maths and computation to be absolutely central to many people's lives. If you take the computer away, you therefore necessarily take away the context of most of the use of mathematics. So it doesn't make any sense to set biology questions in in school maths without a computer, because most of the biology to which you can apply maths can't be done without a computer, it never was. So you therefore end up with these sort of toy word problems that people don't understand and can't associate with their real life, as opposed to real problems that they, with a million data points, which actually look like real life. Real messy problems. So the computer is actually crucial to the subject. So another thing that happens is, you, you know, you probably had Problems like this, if you can remember back to school, I, I, even, I have, um, even though I'm dealing with math stuff all the time, I, I forget some of these things. Similar triangles, inverting matrices, all of those great topics um, that you find the curriculum is labeled by. What I'm thinking we should do is have a problem-centered curriculum that's labeled by actual problems you might want to solve, or that somehow seem interesting to students. So, I mean, uh, one we've used before is, am I normal for teenagers? Is that a maths problem? Can I calculate whether I'm normal? Can it help? You know, is, is normal mean my shoe size or my height or what does this mean? That's not a fuzzy problem which sort of replicates real life. You know, are our incentives working? A problem that all banks should have thought about, uh, amongst others. But it's a common business problem. Are incentives working? That's a typical maths problem in modern life. And you know, modeling that, how do you model that, how do you figure that out, is a maths problem. Is fraud occurring? We have a module about detecting fraud and things. In fact, this was an example I thought I would just quickly show. This is an example where in the classroom we had people, uh, we, had, we divided the class in two, and we had half the students cheating about heads and tails. So they're pretending to toss coins, and they either do what I did, just type in heads or tails. Or they actually do the experiment and type the real results. And the question is, can the teacher tell who's cheated? Well, the answer is, typically the answer is yes, they can. So I, what I've done is I've run an analysis on the data I just entered. And you'll see that I only passed one of the five tests. Now, you know, instead I can get the computer to do this and uh, see if I can just quickly simulate. So this is sort of semi-cheating. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm just basically going to get the computer to pretend I'm tossing coins. Uh, very quickly here. If I can do it quickly. Let's see if I can just write this code and just do this. Um, and what I do then, uh, whoops, uh, I can then pretend that I actually toss the coins and put it in. And you'll probably see if I don't mess this up. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, for some reason, my okay. <coughs> my brain is not controlling my hands appropriately for a moment here. Um, it happens often, but. Uh, let me try, see, it's going to be ones and zeros as opposed to heads and tails, but it's actually pretty much the same idea. And probably, okay, so we managed to computer past all the tests. <laughs> Isn't that amazing that 
a teacher can potentially tell, and the students are often amazed by this, how, how could they tell whether I was cheating or not? But this is sort of a very early step to how bank credit card fraud and things are detected by looking for patterns in the data. Now another question is how does coding, which is this modern subject, relate to maths? Uh, we've heard a lot about coding the last few years as being a very important subject. I actually think it's more important than the government gives it credit for. Because I think coding is the way you write maths down in the modern world. You see, you write, you learn how to write in English, for example, in English in primary, but you use English writing skills in history and maths and science and everything else. Code is the way you write down ideas and technical in, in maths in the modern world. So learning how basic coding works is really important to us. So what have we been doing about this? I, I um, have talked about this for many years. We've been uh, trying to rebuild the maths curriculum from scratch, assuming computers exist. Doesn't sound very revolutionary, but the idea that you should assume computers exist and try to figure out what a maths curriculum should look like uh, apparently has never been done before. And that's what we've been basically embarked on. It's actually quite hard to do because everybody's trained traditionally, and so it's quite hard to think outside that and figure out what it means. I do think CBM, as we call it, is inevitable. And one of the things we I think if maths goes on the way it's going at the moment in schools, we will end up with a situation like classics, where basically general purpose is seen, seen as some side, exciting subject for a very small number of people and completely misses the mark of what's actually required for the workplace and for people's lives. And I think the classicists actually did a rather bad job of defending classics. Not, I'm not particularly making a comment one way or the other on Latin, <coughs> but I don't think they did a good job of defending it. And I think the maths people are doing likewise, although here I think there's a fundamentally different subject that really is needed and immediately applicable everywhere. Um, our first country to try and do this was Estonia. Good question is where the UK is in this and why we uh, have to sort of not lead on things, which I think we could lead on. And I think, in fact, as a society, we're extremely well set up to do the kind of maths I'm talking about. Um, perhaps many, better than many of the Asian societies that I think sort of tend to be more into procedural maths and be very good at that, but perhaps not so good at very creative types of things that I think we could promote. I suppose the bigger message for this, in a sense, is what do you do in education when new machinery comes along in the real world? In my view, you need to stand on that automation and go to the next step up. The human needs to do something more conceptual and not just sort of try to pretend to, to be the machine. I mean, in a sense, in terms of maths, we need first-rate problem solvers who can use maths to help them solve problems, not third-rate human computers that are somehow replicating machines that we built that do better than they do. That's crucially what we need. And I think it's true, it's been true in history of all the sort of technical advances. So we need to work up a level from the machines and not try to compete with the machines. Uh, but it's quite tricky to see where that interface is between the machines and the, uh, and the human. To conclude, the, um, it was one of the nice things, our software, Mathematica, which we launched in 1988. Um, in fact, Steve Jobs was at the launch because we were bundled on Next Machines, which were the things that Steve Jobs made when he was kicked out of Apple the first time, before he came back to Apple. And I, I, ages after I started Computer Based Maths, I, I dug out this quote that he'd given us. And he said at the time, Mathematica will revolutionize the teaching and learning of math uh, by focusing on the pros of mathematics without getting lost in the grammar. A very Steve Jobs sort of quote, very clean quote. And I highlighted the word will because, I mean, it's a very insightful quote, but he made one mistake, which is he should have said should. It should do that, but it didn't yet. It has in the real world, but it hasn't in education. And that's, in a sense, although I'm not specifically talking about Mathematica, but mathematics in general, uh, that is, um, I think, a good a good summary of, of how we are trying to change things and what I think needs to happen. So I hope you can help us unscramble this world of maths and um, look forward to discussing it. Thank you very much.